Yeah, we are live. Hi, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on the geography that you are in. We are here to discuss the role of artificial intelligence and what does the future of work look like post COVID. But before we move to our discussion, a brilliant, brilliant panelist here. We have with us Michael Cheng, my managing director and co founder of Drum Tower Ventures. Michael has 20 years of experience in venture capital, early stage investments, working with private companies in China. Before Drum Tower, Michael was a private investor and served as a director on the board of a number of companies. Next in line, we have Sanjo Tom Jose. Sanjo is a serial entrepreneur with ventures in enterprise SaaS and consumer internet domain. He is one of the prominent thought leaders in the HR tech space. He's also the founder and CEO of Talview. Talview recently won the best AI application for societal impact at Microsoft's AI Awards. Next, we have James Seng. James is a technologist, serial entrepreneur, and investor with nearly 30 years of experience. He's the co-founder and chief operating officer of Void Robotics in Singapore. Then we have Arvind Setu Madhuvan, founder of the AI Living Lab Singapore. Senior Executive Enabling Corporations to Develop and Implement Scalable Innovation and Digital Transformation Programs. External Advisor to Bain, Supporting Media and Digital Practices. He is also an active member of 500 Startups, SMU Big Incubator, and IE Venture Lab. Last but never in the least, we have Karthik Sharma with us, who is the co-founder of Decode AI. Decode AI is building the platform for next generation to be future ready. One can, one can learn artificial intelligence in a simple DIY format. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Uh, these would be our panelists. I'm Anuradha Agarwal, uh, founder of Think North Consulting, your moderator for this discussion. Just a quick reminder of you know, what we seek to achieve here today. As we all know that COVID-19 has put technology in the forefront, the use and the application of technology has been accelerated. On the other hand, there are millions who have lost their jobs, yet AI can potentially result in economic growth. But at the same time, there's also a fear of AI takeover. But can machines really take over? What is the correct balance to achieve? How can the staff be absorbed in this world of emerging technologies? I will invite Michael to share his thoughts. Thank you. Um... If everyone can hear me okay, uh, I'd like to start off on a positive note. I know people have a lot of dystopian views of AI and have a lot of fears. Um, we have a lot of technologists today, so I don't expect to hear that. But if we think about what is AI, it's just a continuation of the computing revolution, right? Uh, computing processing power is increasing and allows at various stages, different applications. And the stage we're entering in is the application of AI. Um, and it's going to be a long process. It's not going to be a sudden shift of the entire economy. So I don't believe that we will have wholesale unemployment. We will certainly have some unemployment due to AI, but not wholesale unemployment. So the question of what is, what is it exactly? What is it like? If we look at history, is it like the Industrial Revolution, which took a whole generation before productivity gains were enough to pass on to the incomes of those workers? Um, is it like electricity, where uh, uh, a platform was created and uh, companies immediately got the productivity benefits? Or was it like the computing revolution, which is something that we're all very intimately aware of. Uh, we see the power of the computers grow every year. Our phones grow every year and allows us to do different things. Um, we see it in our phones. Only 10 years ago, the iPhone was, the first iPhone was out and we marveled at it. And now, you know, we're at the 11th, 12th, 13th generation. So um, that's, that's something we understand. I believe it's more like the computing revolution where uh, it's a new application and it's a great application. It's not something that should be sniffed at, but it's just another application and it will slowly change society. And as long as product productivity is gaining, we should see income gains and also employment gains. Um, but if, if we want to dive deeper in that, um, I hope the other panelists can, maybe we can have a discussion about that. Right, Michael. That's, that's it for now. 
Yeah, Michael, I like like the term that you use wholesale unemployment. Like, you know, I think there's nothing going to be called wholesale unemployment. Now I'd like uh, I'd like to invite Sanju if you'd like to add to this. Thanks, uh, Andrada. Happy to be here. I think Michael uh, said something very important uh, about AI is just an evolution of computing or application of computing uh, technology itself and not a completely new thing as people are already um, there's a lot of uh, I would say fear uh, associated with AI and uh, especially since um, in this forum we are primarily focused on Asia as a geography I, I believe uh, a, for a while um, in in net there will be an um, increase in un- unemployment due to AI and uh, applications of AI Asia stand to, barring a few economies like Japan, um, stand to benefit, uh, at least in short to medium term, for two reasons. One, uh, large-scale applications of AI um, where um, immediate reduction of employment could happen, um, uh, according to most studies, is applicable to industries like retail, transportation, travel. Uh, But these will happen only if these... um, Industries are very organized with large players who could implement AI and AI-related automation um, at, at scale. And I don't think most of the Asian economies have those kind of large um, employers or large players in this space, whether it's retail or transportation. So the uh, I, I believe the advent of AI and the uh, um, loss of jobs or automation associated with it will be much slower uh, for these economies. The second is, and this is something which, um, because we are, we are in a space, uh, the company which I am uh, co-founder and CEO of Talview, uh, we help a lot of large enterprises uh, to hire. And we are seeing that the significant um, focus amongst large enterprises, uh, both in uh, technology sector and also in non-technology, whether you are a retailer or a financial services organization, and investments in uh, one is in building AI based applications and two in uh, improving the quality of uh, data management, both uh, data acquisition and uh, second, uh, the managing the quality of data itself. And most of these jobs today are getting added in um, Asian economies, whether it's India or Philippines or um, Singapore. The, the, a lot of uh, these jobs getting added in uh, these countries and that I believe and I think given um, the uh, workforce advantage some of these economies have uh, especially in Asia um, in the, um, including Southeast Asia and some of the other regions uh, if the governments of these countries invest in the right areas um, I think it's a huge opportunity um, when uh, these industries there is more automation um, being built in there's more data to be managed. There's more data quality to be uh, managed. Um, it, it's going to offer uh, significantly more opportunities than what uh, we are seeing right now uh, in industries like uh, KPOs or BPOs and even uh, even in the digital um, IT services space. So that's my view. Uh, would, would love right. to add more context to it uh, in subsequent uh, questions. Right. Sanju, I think uh, you meant, m- mentioned a very pertinent point, which says not every sector is going, going to get impacted. Like, suppose retail and transportation, you know, it depends on the sector to sector and also from geography to geography. Right. So uh, now would, I would like to invite Arvind, uh, you know, if you could share your thoughts on this, please. Uh, thank you, Anuradha. Um, I think uh, just as an overarching statement, uh, I would like to uh, start by saying that, you know, the rhetoric on AI and there is a lot of hype and that needs to change. My belief is from uh, human versus machine to human plus machine. And, and in the context of uh, um, unemployment and AI replacing jobs, and I would look at three areas in which you need to uh, segment what is happening. And the first is what I call internal versus external. A lot of what is happening with automation is internal within companies. And there are areas like payroll management, uh, accounting, et cetera, which are significantly being automated. But when it comes to external customer-facing engagements, I think 
we are still a way to go because customers are people and they have huge expectations on quality and the whole area of customer experience. The second is something which um, uh, uh, Sanjo touched upon, which is the sectoral focus. We need to have a sectoral focus to this. There are going to be manufacturing intensive industries which are ripe for automation. There are other industries which are not necessarily so. And the third is uh, the context of demographics. And some economies are going to have advantage because of their younger demographic. So what I mean is you need to understand which segments of the population are most likely to get disrupted with AI. And this is where I think increasingly the uh, middle managers to senior managers, depending on the sector, uh, are heavily challenged. And, and in a lot of Asian countries like India, for instance, or Philippines are blessed with a younger population. I think they will be um, much more resilient to the challenge of AI taking over jobs. And, and one final point is, you know, uh, we've been talking about this whole AI taking over jobs and job losses for quite some time. Uh, but this year is going to be a tipping point in which the whole workplace is being redefined. So the concept of a job is not a full time job. Uh, and increasingly, the, what is called the gig economy is going to actually become very strong. So people are going to have possibly two, three more, two, three jobs at a given point in time, which means AI is going to be an enabler. And on that, it's a positive note I leave the audience with that there are bigger positive upsides than downsides. Thank you. I think I agree with you, Arvind, when you say, you know, internal versus external, especially. Uh, because I think uh, a lot of internal processes can be automated. But when it comes to, you know, facing the consumers, it, it really depends on, you know, on what funnel does the con is the consumer on? Is it the top of the funnel, bottom of the funnel, or, you know, towards the end of the funnel? And, you know, if it's towards the end of the funnel, then you need to have, you know, a more human interaction enabled. So I think those are very, very, you know, some deep insights that you shared with us. Uh, can we move on to James now, you know, if you would like to add your thoughts to this? Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the organizer. Um, and I'm very glad to be here today to join you want to have this wonderful discussion. Um, so I've been a technology and to follow what Michael and I will join the echo chamber with Michael and the rest who has spoken so well about uh, the the evolution of artificial intelligence. Uh, I see this as a continuation of the improvement that uh, informationization, computerization and internalization of things that has brought uh, benefit to the human society. And with the advancement of uh, artificial intelligence, um, it's not a new thing by itself. It's just that things that have been used in the back office, say in the factories and the things in the B2B, is now surfacing to reach the consumer in a direct way. In a very direct way, you know, in the past, it's been used in factories, in in businesses that you most people will not in, in see. But today, you see artificial intelligence sitting on your phone and your car and all the devices that's interacting about about with you. Uh, and of course, this caused concern to people who say, "Hey, you know, they are taking our job." Um, in in our cases, we also, uh, no, I, I'm a founder of a robotic company. We utilize a lot of artificial intelligence in our product. Um, we get uh, a lot of feedback uh, that, you know, maybe in a post COVID world where job creation is very important, we should not be using robots to replace our workers and they, we should be giving jobs to the people and not to robots. But what we are witnessing is that actually, our robots are being used more often. We get more requests for our robots post-COVID than before COVID. And it's in the situation whereby uh, place, it's replacing people uh, uh, from from harm. You know, we are, our robots have been deployed where uh, jobs are repet repetitive um, in places where it's dangerous, like in a hospital where you need to do social contact with COVID patients. Um, and in the places where uh, people just don't want to do the job because um, they think it's not paid enough, they are not uh, willing to do the job. But again, in the past, we've not been able to do it with machine because they are not intelligent. But today, we are, the advancement of artificial intelligence and, and the tools that's available to us, we can we can do human-machine co collaboration. They can work together. And this creates a new kind of paradigm of work uh, in the future where we will continue to see human and machine working side by side. 
they're not competing with each other. They're actually they're working in concert. They're working to complete together to finish a task. You know, just like today in uh, 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 most people would be very used to your Apple phone with Siri and you can use your Siri to do multiple tasks and you can assign tasks to them. And, and that evolved to some of these uh, uh, voice activated assistant that we now see in some of the cars, like future cars. Um, I will just set with one of them, <laughs> a friend of my dev demo, and that you can actually use these cars to, uh, you can control um, um, basic functionality on the, uh, your, the window, uh, turn on the music, turn off the air conditioning, you know, by, but through this interaction uh, in a car, which you will not see in, in a traditional uh, car. And in our case, where our robots have been used, we see that it's been replacing workers that uh, in that just do very boring job, you know, that delivering um, a, a mail from point A to point B, delivering a document from point C to point D. Um, this used to be uh, it's, it used to be a very boring job, and now it's being replaced by robots. Uh, I, I see this as an advancement because it free up labors, it free up people who can do more intelligent and better job. Uh, so I'm optimistic about the future for artificial intelligence and what it can bring to the society. So I'll leave it here. Right, James. I think uh, the point that you mentioned about, you know, how humans and AI, they can work in conjunction, you know, rather than, you know, one overlapping the other. I think that's a very important point. And, you know, it is also important to see that how AI, they, you know, how AI can perhaps take on more automated jobs. And, uh, you know, human intelligence can be used for, you know, uh, you know, for more per pertinent and more important jobs. Uh, now I would like to move to Karthik. Karthik, if you can also add to this. Sure, I think and to be the last is always interesting because I can simply summarize all of your interesting wisdom and observations. But I think, uh, at least from where I sit and looking at the topic of AI and the future of work post-COVID, I think just to put some numbers in perspective, a few years ago, World Economic Forum had released a report in which they said that AI is going to create 133 odd million jobs and it will replace 75 odd million jobs. So there was supposedly a net addition of 60 million jobs. Right. Now, in the recent report, uh, it's being said that due to COVID, almost 1 billion jobs are now at risk. So I think it's a double whammy which we're discussing. AI, anyways, was being feared that jobs are going to reduce. Now, COVID has added fuel to the fire, if, if we may say so. And COVID has also made everything contactless and DIY. So there is more and more focus on people not talking to other people and doing things remotely. So I think I, I agree to what Arvind and, and others have said around that. It's not a debate anymore about people versus AI. It's about people who know AI versus people who would not know AI, which happened in the past as well with, with computers, right? So it's not anything new. But I think fundamentally the nature of work is changing now, which needs to be looked from the perspective of AI. So we've got now something called as gig working. So everybody is now working on, on specific gigs. I speak to so many people who are now doing multiple jobs parallelly because it is possible due to remote working. And you know, now with the new age technologies within AI, you've got generative AI, right? So GPT-3 is here, which OpenAI has, has produced, right? So you do not need a big team to even develop, do coding. So coding is also now redundant. People used to think that tech people are insulated because they will always be developing stuff. But with AI, you can develop generative code. So I think that really impacts almost all the industries now. But there's also an interesting point that there are certain developing nations, and specifically India is, is a large contributor uh, in, in, on that front, wherein because of low digital literacy, lack of a proper internet connection all the time, and lack of infrastructure, there would still be a lot of requirement of, of manual intervention. And all these AI systems may not work directly. And here, a lot of people are working on things like impact sourcing. So I was reading about an organization called uh, Humans in the Loop, wherein they work with uh, vulnerable communities and they train them to do things uh, like data labeling or 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 do or you know training data. So all the basic tasks within uh, AI modeling as well, they are trying to do it in developing countries. And now, as we know in AI, the future is around unsupervised learning. So these tasks would also get eliminated because if you have unsupervised learning, you don't even know any explicit laboring to be done, right? So in that front, there are two, two, three broad categories of work which is being envisaged. So we're looking at people who could be 
uh, you know, AI, AI modeling, AI, AI trainers. We're looking at people who could be AI explainers because uh, ethics, bias and explainability in AI is a big question, which all the uh, large organizations like Google and Facebook are facing with. Right. So we're looking at people who can actually help in, in contributing to that. And I think at least for next 15 to 20 years, how much soever AI may become pervasive in our lives, we would always need uh, monitoring and supervising what AI is doing, right? So even in case of self-driving cars and autonomous systems, we always have faced, uh, you know, situations that present a dilemma to AI. And sometimes the actions which are done by AI are not explainable easily uh, by the developers. So I think in that case, we would always need uh, people who can help in creating a better explainability of AI and monitor AI systems to make sure that the decisions being done by autonomous systems are consistent with what a human would like uh, to experience. And I think uh, on, on the last front, especially the developing economies, because since I come from India and we have 1.3 billion people here, and anyways, the unemployment is, a, is an all time high. So with AI and COVID, I think more and more work around uh, impact sourcing needs to be done in these developing countries to make sure that at least the state we are in, whether it's about using chatbots or RPAs, we at least train and skill our people on basics of at least supervised learning for now so that they can do basic stuff like data labeling, tagging, train the data sets. And I think at least prepare them for a world in which unsupervised learning is going to take over in at least 10 to 15 years. And I think uh, we also need to look at a more inclusive approach uh, around using AI when we're talking about jobs. So at least preempt some of these, uh, you know, like generative AI. I think all of us here would agree uh, that when generative AI takes over, then it's going to impact almost all the sectors and almost all the job roles. So I think how do we uh, prepare for that sort of a future in which uh, AI is going to be generative and not explicitly coded by us? So I think we should look at that more inclusive approach. Uh, that's my view, Nuragam. Yeah, Karthik, I think uh, what you mentioned was very interesting in terms of, you know, how you don't really need to know coding to be able to access everything now. So suppose, you know, there are a lot of brands, so there's something called Taylor Brands. I mean, you can just you can just get a logo done with, you know, through artificial intelligence. There are a lot of other softwares like Canva and as a marketer, I, you know, I use those. And you, so basically it's like, you know, low coding and still, you know, getting into the world of AI and which I think you're already doing, you know, at your organization with Decode AI. I think, uh, you know, we have a brilliant uh, mix of uh, minds here. And what is uh, so fascinating that you all are technology evangelists, you know, in your own rights. But your applications might be very, very different. I see somebody from HR, somebody who is, you know, who's into venture capital and investing into firms that, you know, who are looking at AI. Hence, I would ask, you know, the, the experts to share specific examples pertaining to your industry. So, Michael, if you can go first, please. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting question. I, I think if I could take a step back, uh, the first approach of AI, or at least the approach of some, was the faith in the data, uh, particularly quantity, would solve everything. And uh, if I were to uh, pick out a field, um, it would be autonomous driving is an example of of that. And you know, we've always been one year away from autonomous driving, right? We're still one year away after 10 years from autonomous driving. Um, the, the issue there is um, how much is enough data for your particular field? And um, for that particular field, it doesn't seem like there's ever enough data to, to solve the issue. That's number one. Um, number two, if you, t if you take a further step back, you think about where, where would you see AI first? in the world. And I, I'll give a shout out to uh, James here. Um, you would see it in service robots first before autonomous driving. I mean, if you think about it, we, we would have our robots clean our windows before we have them drive the cars, right? We trust them with the windows first and, and our, our children second. <laughs> so, you know, why would anyone think that we would have a world of autonomous driving before we have a world full of service robots, right? This just doesn't, doesn't make sense. Um, and the, the, the difficulty is, is that robots do things well that uh, robots do well and humans do things well that humans do well. Humans have millions of, year, million of years of evolution, particularly dealing with the physical world. And uh, robots do not. 
it's actually very difficult to to teach a robot how to handle the physical world. So in in a closed system, a closed environment, um, slow movement, that's where you you'll see uh, the initial applications, and not in fast moving, uh, wild, you know, hard to predict environments. Um, the other areas that uh, AI should be able to do massive calculations. We saw that in um, the chess and the Go. Um, you know, there's no chance and poker. There's no chance a human can calculate that many times and beat a, a, a computer. Now the question is, is the computer better at pattern recognition than humans? And I would say probably yes. So that's going to be the really interesting application of, of AI is um, given enough data, not too much, uh, given enough quality data, what is the pattern recognition that a robot will see that a human may not see uh, potentially because of bias or some other reason. So um, I, I see this as a gradual uh, evolution and I see very interesting things happening. We're just in the AI infancy. The uh, AI is a baby right now. So uh, I would suggest everyone be very patient uh, with, with the, you know, the world completely changing. Right, Michael. I think like you said, the last decade was all about data collection and the next decade is all going to be about data optimization. Sanju, if you'd like to add your thoughts to this. I think um, like Michael spoke uh, spoke about how long it's going to take for AI to impact um, a lot of industries in a meaningful way. Um, but at the same time, I believe there are also industries where many times people attribute it to AI, but it's basic automation, which is leading to job loss or, uh, uh, or change in, changing the, uh, change in the architecture of the employment itself. And, um, and at, at the end of the day, it, it's the impact we are talking about uh, and probably not necessarily the underlying technology. So from an impact standpoint, it's going to be the pace of impact is going to gradually increase. Um, and going back to the previous point about this is an evolution of computation technology itself. So, so from uh, from that standpoint, I think countries um, and uh, in in the context of this forum, countries have to be ready to invest uh, to equip their workforce uh, to manage uh, this change and. Uh, Platforms like what Karthik is building is going to be instrumental in managing uh, the kind of uh, change or uh, enabling the kind of investments which uh, are uh, more practical for uh, especially countries uh, in Asia. And so, uh, for example, I've been so I I come from um, um, a state uh, called Kerala in India. So that before moving to the US, I used to live there. I'm still involved in some of the uh, government initiatives there where uh, there the government is proactively uh, training the youth for uh, skill sets, which uh, some of these things which Karthik spoke about, like data management, data quality, um, uh, uh, supervised learning. So I think those areas, those skill sets are going to uh, generate significant amount of job uh, job opportunities for uh, talent in many of the Asian economies if the government decide to invest in the right areas. So that's going to be instrumental to cope up with this change. The uh, second aspect is, um, I think, also about how um, many times the narrative around AI is uh, impacting the way in which uh, countries and uh, more importantly, organizations react to them. So uh, we, we work with a lot of um, large uh, retail organizations, especially in the U.S., who has been at the forefront of investing in AI in terms of automation of uh, their retail stores, uh, automation of their warehouse uh, management. But I think um, what we are seeing is when they are... Uh, and because their hiring happens on our platform, so we see how the roles are evolving over a period of time. So while automation is happening in one particular area, there is uh, new ro- there are new roles which are opening up in another area. For example, in retail, uh, we 
we are seeing there is significant automation on uh, the billing or the point of sale aspect so where custom there uh, they are cutting down, down on roles who, uh, which which were earlier primarily uh, people who are manning the uh, payment stations uh, but then they are adding more roles for customer advisors or people who are um, where uh, machine or ai cannot easily uh, uh, replace a human like where they, they, now they want more more uh, more employees who are interacting with customers uh, many of them are emulating the apple genius bar model uh, even in so that's not just happening in tech, um, in uh, electronic stores it's happening in fashion stores it's happening in uh, uh, cosmetics so across areas there are new roles which are getting added uh, which is uh, opening up new job opportunities so i think um, as long as so when something like covid happens or the ability for consumers to spend goes down and that definitely is going to have a short to mid term impact but as long as the economies keep growing i think new job roles which are which are centered around human to human connects will will exist so i think it's a two two sided story of one side where countries need to invest in uh, aspects like supervised learning data management data quality to ensure that they there are new job opportunities gen- getting generated for their workforce and the on, on the other side i think new roles will continue to evolve and um, i think it's more about coping up with change management than about uh, fear, fearing job loss or uh, yeah something to worry about right sanju i think the human interaction can never be replaced yes obviously it can be you know overlap with machines you know at the initial stages uh now i'd like to invite arvind i think you know considering that he's involved with a lot of b2b businesses and offering them ai solutions perhaps you know he can give us an overview and ex- specific examples that you know how do you think that this is going to go about arvind you're on mute okay sorry uh thanks anurag i think um, my view is you know the next coming decade is going to be about application of ai and which is not dependent on having uh, ai capability or ai uh, resources in place and what i mean by this is you know a uh, lot of platforms have ai built into them uh, these, these are scaled technology platforms so when you look at google facebook etc and uh, and they have got fantastic uh, ai practitioners who are training their technologies to create personalization at scale and the challenge is is this reaching the masses and i think this is where uh, the tipping point is going to be about public private partnerships which actually make this happen for small businesses as an example and um, to give you an example uh, here in singapore imda uh, which is the infocom and media development authority launched an initiative for the bet markets um, these are small stalls just like in any emerging economy which sell their produce fresh uh, vegetables meat seafood etc and um, the challenge was with lockdowns etc how do these people actually survive and um, so this was an initiative which focused on bringing technology to these wet markets which was enabled by the facebook platform so they could actually on a daily basis get on to the facebook live video talk about their produce and what they have use facebook messenger to complete the sale uh, and they built in a local um, very uh, famous um, payment application called paynow which is by one of the leading banks here so they built a solution which was end to end which enabled a small business owner in a wet market food stall who could actually embrace technology in this case you know none of these guys actually even possibly knew that they were looking at ai but this was just a small step in the way of how um you can actually start looking at application of ai without getting into the larger challenges around data and all the algorithms etc and i'm seeing increasingly lot of public private partnerships which are coming in place which are driving small business adoption of technology solutions which enable them to succeed either in terms of customer uh, acquisition retention or even selling their products and goods um so i think from an application point you know that that needs to happen more uh, and governments need to lean in more heavily to help these small businesses out 
and the technology is already there. It's just a question of how you get it to them uh, and enable them to succeed. Uh, right, uh, Arvind, I think that's a very important point, considering how it is almost impossible for every small business to have an AI team of its own. So I think the collaborative effort is what is going to take everybody you know, forward together. Uh, James, if I can also have your thoughts and you know your experience from venture capital into you know how do you think the future is going to look like and where should people focus when it comes to AI? Yeah, so um, you know I take the view that um, AI is not a comparator uh, to human. Um, in, in 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 essence, it actually cooperate with human being in many ways. Um, you no, know, one of the role one of the use cases for robots is in restaurant. And we've been talking to many restaurant owners um, uh, to give you some data. Like in 1996, uh, if uh, for every one waiter job created in a restaurant, there's about 120 people in China. All right, I'm talking about Chinese, right? We're talking about 1.4 billion people here. For every jobs that is available uh, that open up in a restaurant, there's 120 people queuing up for that one job. That's 1996. In last year, for every job uh, that is open up, they only get 0.6 people applying. So they can't even fill the jobs today. And this is the changing of the demography. As younger people become more educated, they, they, they like to pursue more meaningful and creative job and therefore you start to see jobs like waiter become shine by these young people and our robots become um uh, essential it's, it's not it's not a gimmick it's no longer a gimmick that you put in the front door that greet the guests we do we still do that by the way we have robots that sit in front of tangong right in beijing you go to beijing you see our robots there and entertain the guests but we really start to see our robots are being used in productive, uh, uh, in, in the work process flow of a restaurant where they actually mix the robot to be used because they couldn't hire and retain the worker in the restaurant. Um, and to give you another data, we, I have, uh, with, I have an owner of a five star restaurant in a third tier cities. Um, he has about 120 people working for him. And only less than five works more than a year. That's how high the turnover. Uh, and we are talking about the largest country, 1.4 billion people. And I can, I can imagine in more developed places where you know, younger people aspire for higher things as it, the society develops, it gets worse and worse. And when I was back in Singapore you know, for the last 10 months, I've spoken to a lot of people, uh, and including especially during COVID where a lot of, and, and I think Irving would know that we, we have a case, we have a lot of cases of dormitory workers that was locked down because of COVID spread in our dormitory. Um, I spoke with Cisco, uh, Cisco security or Cisco security, and is robots become a very important, essential part of their plan because now they couldn't send policemen or patrols at night, you know, to go out, uh, because they're worried worry about catching the COVID and they're, and their staff are stuck in the dormitory because they're under quarantine. So they, they have to rely on robots that actually patrol. Uh, some of these are still human assisted. You know, you have a human mind person behind, you know, controlling the robot. Some, some are aut fully autonomous. Um, but eventually it, you, this will be pervasive, you know, service robot will be pervasive in the society. But having all said that, you know, um, I'm, I think it's very, very important to also to understand that service robots and the implementation of artificial intelligence in the service industry is very nuanced. It's very early stage. Um, you know, today we have robots that clean the swipe the floor, you know, and they ship millions of units per month. Um, but the whole service industry of robots may, may, may sell maybe a thousand units. That's all. So I, I think there's a lot of room of growth. There will be more things to grow. Um, and from moving from here, and I think we'll see more and more uh, creative use of artificial intelligence and robots in our society. Right, James, thank you for your views. I think it got me thinking on how uh, is it uh, is it difficult to retain people then to tame the technology? So I think I'm going to make a few points and research on that. And uh, next, I'll move to Karthik and, you know, if he'd like to share his examples from his experience. 
Sure. So uh, I think from all of you, uh, what I have learned is that AI is going to be becoming more and more pervasive. More and more people are going to be trained in AI. And I think where I sit, I see that lack of available manpower, which is skilled in AI, is a big problem. I was reading a OECD report in which it said that more than 30 odd percentage of job vacancies in AI are lying vacant. I mean, that's one industry which has got so many job openings, but we don't have enough people who are trained in it, right? Now, training them has got its own set of challenges. For example, you don't have uh, available practitioners or facilitators or teachers who are also trained in AI and who are ready to give up their time for, for teaching AI to young people. Then let's say if somebody wants to learn AI, they also need heavy computational power. You know, they need GPUs on demand. How do you do that? So, uh, you know, in our organization, Decode AI, that's what we are focusing on. So we have created our own platform, which has got its own orchestration of a containerized architecture. So we don't need to have heavy computational power at your end. Then, you know, within AI, you've got multiple components, right? It's not only data, you've got NLP, CV, so on and so forth. So how do you train people on these specific niche skill sets as well? That's a big problem as well. So that's what we are uh, focused on. And I think, uh, as, mo- as I think most of you have talked about this, that it's not about um, machine versus man, right? So if we are able to skill our young people and future-proof them, I think we, we would not have a problem uh, which that doomsday which people so kind of forecast, right? That in 10, 15 years, you're going to wake up and you just need to have a universal basic income because there will no- be no jobs, right? Companies would be paying robot tax and everybody would be sitting at home. I think that situation can be uh, future-proofed in, in some ways if we are able to upskill our resources, our young people specifically, because it's very hard for somebody, uh, you know, like you and me who are already uh, in sort of mid, mid-level of our career journey to get trained on a completely new topic. But I can tell you I've got amazing stories where a 13-year-old or a 14-year-old who, who sort of trains with us, they can create chatbot like, you know, in, in a day. And not using dialogue flow, but like using TensorFlow and like from the scratch, they can build a good bot, which our developers take a few days in, in, in building. So I think if you train these young people in the right manner, I think we will not have this problem in at least in midterm to long term. We will not have a situation of people not having enough jobs. But I think the impetus is on us rather than to just sort of complain and argue about what might happen. I think some of us, and that's what I actually personally did, right? I was into an AI practitioner work. We were building RPAs, chatbots for the companies, B2B. Then when I realized that the bigger issue at hand is going to be in future training these people. So that's where I personally shifted my focus on, on actually solving the bigger problem. And I really urge all of you here to at least devote some percentage of your time as, as practitioners of AI in the real world to support the next generation. So they are future proof and we don't have this skill shortage. Thanks, Anurag. Right. Hi, uh, yeah. Thank you, Karthik. I think uh, what you're doing with the organization is also in some way democratizing, you know, AI for everybody. So, you know, what is so overwhelming at this stage is, you know, when somebody wants to learn AI, I mean, there's so much of information and there's so much of data and it's, you know, it's not even bifurcated, you know, according to a sector. So you, a new person doesn't even can't even understand where to start learning from. So I think those were some very, very interesting thoughts. And if I could just have like quick 30 seconds of everybody and, you know, if you all can put your closing remarks, then that would be great. So can we start with Michael first? We're not going to make it. Hello. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, only a minute. Um, yeah, I, I think everyone is pretty positive. I, I, I want to tell everyone to be aware of the Luddites who uh, in the old days attacked the, the new sewing machines. Um, so, I mean, we should have the same sort of perspective on these things. Right. Uh, Arvind, what can emerging entrepreneurs, you know, learn, uh, you know, from the AI wave that is coming in? I think it is just a huge opportunity. I think for emerging auto- entrepreneurs, it's not about building. Uh, like I said, these days, everything is plug and play when it comes to AI. Uh, I work with startups where they are working very closely with platforms which have already have the pre-trained models. So just embrace AI in its full force. Right. I, I think, guys, you know, we have already reached our time. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you, you know, for being here. Uh, stay safe and have a great week, week, uh, week ahead. Bye-bye.
Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Groovy.